one for mum, one for dad, and one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be an Australian. Budgets are about choices, Fran, and you show what you value through the choices you make. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't treasurer. be scared. The the treasurer knows. I want an economy that works for people, not the other way around. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy. You know, banana republic. Just follow the money. G'day, and welcome to Follow the Money the Australia Institute's podcast that explains big economic issues in plain English. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute, and today's episode is part of our special Follow the Money Summer Series, where we'll be bringing you a selection of some of the best conversations from our popular webinar series. In her new quarterly essay, Lone Wolf, political editor at Guardian Australia, Catherine Murphy, offers a new portrait of Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. Drawing on interviews with Anthony Albanese himself, Greens leader Adam Bent, as well as people like Penny Wong, Simon Holmes Accord, Zoe Daniel and more, Murphy's brilliant essay draws out the meaning of an eventful political year. She offers a telling character study of the Prime Minister, investigates the success of the Teals and the Greens, and looks to the challenges of the future. This was recorded live on Tuesday the 6th of November 2022, and things may have changed since recording. In Lone Wolf, Catherine, uh, you are not only looking at a portrait of Anthony Albanese, but kind of digging through the entrails of the 2022 election, federal election campaign, and covering things like the rise of the Teals, the success of the Greens, and how kind of this new parliament will work. There's a huge amount um, to get into with this, (laughs) and I do just want to congratulate you on it. As I said, I got it yesterday. I picked it up and could not put it down once I started reading it. It's a really gripping read, given we all know the outcome. Yeah, exactly. And Ebony <laughs> knows the story already, so it's kind of incredible. But I do realise that this is a specific genre of writing that I love, going through the entrails of things with that little behind-the-scenes mm-hmm. look at how it all works. So before we get into, I guess, the, the guts of the quarterly essay and what it covers, I wanted to ask your process question mm-hmm. first. A long read like this. How many words is it, did you say? (laughs) 35,000, but who's counting? Yeah, how do you dive into a project like that as a journalist? Where do you start? Thank you for that question. I I really appreciate that. Uh, And also I just want to uh, tell all of the uh, folks with us today on the webinars, uh, you know, thank you for your support. Uh, And uh, we have collaborated, as regulars will know, in other in other webinars and projects, and I'm very grateful for your support. Um, in terms of uh, well, God, thirty five thousand words. Where do you start? <laughs> and with a story like this, because it is a bit cinematic, the story, and I wanted it to be. Uh, it's sort of it's it's an essay in two parts. Eb. Uh, the, the sort of first, I don't know, 60, 60 odd percent is a, a character study of Anthony Albanese, uh, our current prime minister. Uh, and because he is still a relatively unknown figure outside people who are really engaged with politics. Uh, and I wanted, obviously, there was an excellent biography written of him a couple of years ago by Karen Middleton, a journalistic colleague of mine. And if you are really interested in Anthony Albanese, uh, I, I very much recommend you tracking down Karen's book because that is really forensic in terms of the whole biography and story. Uh, mine is a, mine's a little bit compressed, obviously, for length, but uh, what I really wanted to achieve uh, with that, with the character study element of the essay was a character study, and by that I mean get into the psychology of how our Prime Minister operates and why he operates in the way that he does. But yours was a process question, right? Yeah. So how do you how do you put this together? Because it was partly about the Prime Minister and partly about the story of the election. Uh, funnily enough, the, the the structure suggested itself to me in two of the first conversations I had for the piece. One was with the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, who at one point uh, spoke to me about 2020, which was the hardest year in opposition, as being like diving under a wave. You just basically, you saw this enormous wave coming at you, which jumper. was the pandemic yeah. that was going to plow your head first into the ground you could either stand there and try and argue with it or you could just go underneath it and then 
and then s- sort of surface at a time when that was more politically yeah incredibly beneficial. hard to be in opposition during those times that's that's it yeah. right so the wave and then I had an initial conversation with Simon Home Support who is uh, the obviously the organizer founder of Climate 200 that was a, a really important super PAC style action committee that funded a, a number of the Teals campaigns and funnily enough, without reference to one another, Simon opened his account of things by talking about uh, that they were in the way, they were on the wave paddling on their surfboards. So when the wave came, the beneficial wave for Teals and progressive candidates in the inner city, he was already on the board Ready and to waiting catch to it. catch it. So I thought, my God, how amazing. Like the, the, the structure of the essay has been just suggested in two conversations. So And a very Australian metaphor. So well, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I thought it would work. It certainly resonated with me. So we sort of had, you know, Anthony Albanese submerging and then we had Simon Holmes Court, big, big surf riding. Um, and that sort of took us into the back half of the essay, which is what happened in the election. In the actual election. And then the Prime Minister gets the final word on yeah. what might happen in the future. Yeah. So digging into this portrait, of Anthony Albanese as a leader and a person. The title is obviously Lone Wolf, and I wonder if you could just explain that a little bit to us, why you landed on on that title, and what he's learned about leadership along this journey from opposition leader to prime minister. Mm. Well, that to me has been one of the more interesting trajectories that he's been on the last three years. Uh, Just sort of a bit of quick background. Anthony Albanese and I arrived in politics in the, at the same time, same year. He arrived in Parliament, I arrived in the press gallery. So I've known him for a very long time and watched him in different capacities for a very long time. The thing that was sort of most interesting to me about uh, the story of the last three years was him evolving from this lone wolf operator, insurgent political operator, to, uh, to a more, I guess it's conventional, leadership model where you've got a good team, you need to draw on them. Uh, And in fact, the team actually becomes part of your advantage Mm. in a political conversation that happens in 2022. Now, look, for some folks watching on with us today, I'm sure you'd just shrug your shoulders and say, well, God, leadership, you just don't go do a course or something, right? You know, you you can learn to lead. Um, I think what's really fascinating about uh, Anthony Albanese as a person and he is he is genuinely a prime minister you need to understand as a person, I think, in order to understand how he operates. Uh, he spent a lot of time in childhood. People will know this story. Don't roll your eyes. I understand. Um, he spent a lot of time in childhood uh, alone uh, with uh, his mother who was incapacitated by illness. Uh, he had to accept a lot of personal responsibility and practical responsibility very early in life. As he says to me at one point in the essay, if I didn't plan, we didn't eat. Yeah. So he was a kid whose circumstances demanded uh, be an adult in many in many uh, phases of life. Um, and he developed habits at that point, which are really hardwired, uh, which is, this is all on me. I need to think three steps ahead. I can't rely on anyone. I've just, it's its me or, or nothing. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, that those habits actually were reinforced, oddly, uh, as Anthony Albanese kind of moved out of adolescence and became an, a student activist and then sort of moved into the, into the Labor Party in Sydney in that kind of you know, those times of, of the 80s, I guess, the early 80s in Sydney, the whole left scene in Sydney is, yeah. I think, really fascinating at that point. But oddly enough, I think those habits of being a bit of a lonely figure, a bit of a sole operator, were actually reinforced by politics because, again, a really critical thing to understand about the Prime Minister is he is from uh, the minority wing of the minority faction in the Labor Party. He was from the hard left in Sydney, at a time when everybody just deified the New South Wales right. Yeah. Uh, this is Paul Keating's kind of zenith. Um, times have changed. <laughs> times have changed. <laughs> times have changed, Deb. I think that's a fair, that's a fair observation there. But but that was really formative for him. So he was from the minority group in the in the minority faction. He was ambitious, impatient, I think slightly volcanic. <laughs> uh 
And he learned that if he was basically to progress in Labor politics, which was his great desire, he had to blast his way in. Forge his own path. For, forge his own path. But more than that, like quite quite aggressively and assertively forge his own path yeah. and institutionally take on forces who had the numbers to thwart him. Yeah. So what uh, the way I characterise this is that he developed an insurgents mindset. Right. And if we think about insurgents, I mean, perhaps we don't want to think about some insurgents at all, but if we think about how they operate, it's it's always need to know. Mm. Right. There's a very small circle of trust. You don't communicate your objectives beyond the circle of trust. You certainly don't develop strategy or policy in groups. You just yeah. don't do that because, you know, you could die. The risk is too great. You could die yeah. professionally doing that. Right. So I think the sort of that 20 years of political operation actually reinforced this sense of solitariness, that, yeah. it, that it was all on him and all in his head. So what he had to do over the last three years uh, with the colleagues was to convince them and through them, the Australian po uh, public, that he had the skills to lead, that he had the skills to build a team, to rely on people uh, you know, even when he wasn't entirely certain of their motives. Yeah. And that for a guy of, of middle age, you know, these are these are really hardwired habits that you, you're trying to unpick and mm. trying to unpick in, you know, with, with time accelerating. So uh, we I delve into that quite a bit. Yeah, I was really struck. You talked about that he needed to learn that leading the Labor Party wasn't a hostile takeover yeah. or a, a solo act. And then a little bit later that um, he learned things like, you know, if you're going to be leading a big group uh, or cabinet meetings, for example, you can't telegraph your opinion on something too early, which I found a really interesting observation. Yeah. But I always uh, also was really interested in he he did learn new things, yes. which was quite a contrast to Scott Morrison <laughs> and the end of, you know, yeah. the last quarterly essay that you did where he was just like, no, I'm. I've got this. Yeah, I've got this. You know, step back, babe. I've got this. Yeah. You know, it was sort of, yeah, we, the, the character studies, the two character studies that I've been called to do in these long form essays, you know, could not be more different <laughs> yeah. like, at, at all kinds of levels. But that's fascinating for me mm. as a writer that just because they're, you know, these people are all doing really important jobs, very stressful jobs in very stressful times. They all operate differently. They have a different sense of themselves. They have a different sense of how they project into groups. And that's because politics for me is kind of like anthropology, right? Like that's why I'm sort of interested in it. So, yes, they they were very different. They responded to events differently. They learned different lessons, he and Morrison. And in the end, the counterpoint between those two states became quite important for Labor's electoral fortunes mm. although I don't think that Anthony Albanese would have set out with that as a plan that yeah. was a found strategy in a way but yeah I think it was an important contrast that actually sort of was was it was helped basically helped Labor you know pick up pick up the seats that Labor needed in order to form a majority government I think yeah. that was part of the story um so before we kind of dive into the election campaign um you write a lot about um, Albanese's strategic thinking and looked at that through kind of a policy prism, some of the big calls that he made on policy. And I'm thinking here particularly about childcare and the voice to parliament. Why, do, why are those two policies, what do they tell us about him as a leader and those fights that he's willing to pick or, 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 or stake his flag yeah, in? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, uh, look, I think, uh, in a, it, I had to narrow the field in the way there were, there were more, there were, there were a number of important decisions, but for my observation, childcare was a really important early call. This was in the first year of his opposition leadership. Um, he was he basically made a captain's call on that package. He was resisted fiercely by most of the leadership group and most of the shadow cabinet. Uh, you know, they were all worried about the price tag. You know that they would that this was would basically cost a bomb. And they had just come out of an election campaign where they'd spent a lot of money and yeah. Australians had gone, oh, no, thanks, I don't want a bit the, too much. bit too much, right? So this was an early call he made uh, uh, and he got pushback right up until literally hours before he announced it. Um, and, you know, he said to the colleagues in collaborative style, bring me something else. 
like if there's a better idea I'll hear it I'll listen but yeah. I'm convinced this is right I'm convinced this is what we need to do now and it can't just be good it's got to be better exactly right so anyway so we made that call uh and as it turned out uh that was an early down payment in Labor's economic strategy uh and it was also an appeal to women that became very very important over the ensuing couple of years yeah so that was important um the voice I think is important because it's sort of as his as his great friend Meredith Bergman says he's a sort of 1970s 80s left left wing left winger right he he wants he he has this sense of social causes that they're important so I think that tells you a little bit about his politics because I think a lot of people look at Albanese now and can't see the guy who liked to fight Tories <laughs> you know that guy seems to have vanished off the yeah. sort of beater Albo doesn't seem as present anymore I think the voice takes us to beta Albo the other thing is also climate change which was the absolutely critical call that mm. they made and again fascinating boy oh boy guys I wish I knew this in real time um, but uh, that was an absolute struggle to the nth degree as well with the colleagues, not because anyone thought climate action was a terrible idea. They all thought climate action was important, but they had literally lost every election campaign since 2013 yeah. with climate being part of the story. And when the 43% 2030 target came into Shadow Cabinet after being contested vigorously in the leadership group for most of the week leading up to the decision when that target arrived in the shadow cabinet meeting on that Friday in December uh, a number of people have described what happened next as a collective anxiety attack <laughs> happened around the table which you can totally understand well I, I could understand it I was mm. unaware of it in real time but uh, but uh, that was how it was described to me it was mm. sort of even people who had been solid on climate action the whole way, all through the climate wars, they they sort of had this moment where they thought, oh, my God, this will either save us or kill us and we really don't know which it is. Yeah. So, and that whole discussion played out. Anyway, obviously, Chris Bowen, the, the uh, res uh, responsible shadow minister, got his target. It came out, it was announced, and it was critical in yeah, the end. as it turned out. And um, there's a couple of interesting observations around that change from um, Mark Butler to Chris Bowen that you should buy the essay and read it because I found that really interesting on how to deal with the internal politics of things. But I do kind of want to stick with climate as an issue that did become fundamental Massive. to the election. It was kind of promised over several elections and hadn't turned up electorally and this was really the election where it became fundamental and as you said they could have made Labor could have made quite a, a different decision yeah. and it would have actually probably harmed, harmed them electorally them. in this yes exactly the atmosphere I, that we saw and Chris Bowen says that quite candidly yeah in the essay it's sort of like because basically the two options that Labor wrestled with through that basically uh, once Chris Bowen came into the portfolio and they were rebooting the climate policy, they had two sort of indicative options through that 12 months, basically. One was a kind of minimalist, safe option where the 2030 target would be somewhere in the 30s, so higher than the coalitions, but well below what the what science taken to demand, the yep. demanded and well below what they'd taken to the election with some funding for renewables and other things. That was considered a low-risk option. Then there was the higher risk option, which was ambition in the in the forties. I do think that Chris Bowen actually considered a target over fifty at one point. Yeah. Um, but I think basically the Reputex work they commissioned, uh, which was basically a sort of set of economic analysis to work out what they could deliver and what they could sell and defend. I think that settled the number. Um, for Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy <laughs> fans, you'll love that. At one point, the indicative number was forty-two which uh, if you're a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fan, you'll know is the, you know, answer, answer to, to life, life and, love and the universe. Yeah. Anyway, it was 43. <laughs> and and as you say, it, it, uh, it became very critical to, um, to the contests, certainly that played out in the metro and inner metro rims in, uh, in that election. And Chris Barnes says very candidly, had we not taken the more ambitious option you know we would have lost yeah basically because voters would not have voters who wanted climate action would not have been given something to vote for yeah there wasn't a, a there material wasn't. difference exactly. enough of a difference exactly. yeah between the 
Liberal Party and Labor. Um, you also catalogue uh, some of the other big uh, developments and electoral shifts from this election, which of course is, well, on the one hand, the decimation of the, the Liberals, yeah. um, but mostly the, the success of the independents, um, particularly in those inner city electorates, um, the so-called Teals, as well as the, the Greens mm -hmm. winning seats from uh, the Liberals, as well as Labor in yeah. Queensland. A lot of that was linked to climate, but also integrity. I was also just really interested, you spoke to Zoe Daniel, mm -hmm. and they've obviously all got their own reasons why they came into Parliament, but talking to her specifically where Obviously, climate change is important, but integrity seemed to be such yeah. a key thing for her. Having reported on the Donald Trump, Trump yeah, exactly. presidency, exactly. she kind of had this sense that she couldn't actually sit it out. No. It was her obligation no. to step up. Yeah, I was really, um, moved is not the quite, quite the right word, uh, but uh, when we had that conversation, I understood her motives entirely. Uh, Zoe Daniel is uh, basically won the seat of Goldstein in in Victoria from uh, the Liberal incumbent, incumbent Tim Wilson. She had to be persuaded to run uh, because she is obviously she's a female journalist. She's been in the public domain for quite a long time. She understands, uh, you know, some of the free feedback that you can be given as a as a, a you know a moderate public figure. Parts of her family were against it. Uh, just concerned for her well-being. Her son uh, was actually really for it, really pro, and just said, you know, you have to do this. But anyway, she and I had this conversation. Uh, I'm still a journalist. She's a former journalist. And I asked her to, to really distill the why of why she stepped forward. And as you say, Ed, climate's important. Uh, and, and the other issues that they ran on were important to her and particularly her kids. But for her, as a professional, she had reported on the Trump administration in the US as the Washington correspondent for the ABC for a number of years. What she saw there in terms of democratic decay really troubled her at a, at a, at a visceral, profound level. Uh, she could see when she returned home sort of echoes of that tone and rancor and elements where we could sort of slide along the same direction. Now, I don't think Zoe Daniel ever said to me at any point that she was the one woman antidote to any of these <laughs> mega trends, but she said it was really that 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 radicalized me that and I thought uh, I have to I have to do whatever I can to try and make sure we don't end up in the same place. Mm. And part of you was also, as you said, talking to Simon Holmescourt about the Climate 200. And again, uh, make sure you read the essay. I think there's some really interesting things in there about the invitation, I think, to Kathy McGowan to join, which she um, um, decided not to for various reasons. But the independents obviously were hugely successful in this election, particularly in those liberal um, heartland seats yeah. on the one hand that made the path to victory easier for labor not that they ended up um, needing it but I'm just interested we had seen kind of Helen Haynes and Zali Stegall um, candidates like that um, MPs like that being kind of the early model yeah. but this was just on a whole different scale yeah um, part of that I think you've talked about was um the unlikability of Scott Morrison being a factor, yeah. but what really made 2022 different to 2019 for independence? Well, I think, uh, you know, you, you've touched on it there and we were talking about radicalising forces a minute ago. Well, the, the primary radicalising force in the 2022 election was Scott Morrison. Uh, I, certainly that's the, the view that uh, the independence fraternity have. That is the, the view that the Labor Party has. Uh, some of you guys will have seen reports last night of, the, of Labor's campaign review, which was released late yesterday, in which this point is made quite forcefully. Paul Erickson, who is Labor's campaign director, who I spoke to for the essay, also makes this point forcefully that Morrison was a really radicalising force for a number of Australian voters. Um, that It sounds a bit passive, like before I get to your point, which is what was the difference, mm -hmm. right? Why did it, it, that can sound a little bit passive 
when we when we make that observation that oh everyone just sort of sat back and thought oh that Scott Morrison he's a bit of a dud right and then everyone just turns up all these independents turn up and the Labor Party turns up and they win because everyone's sick of the other guy um, look there is there's there's some truth to that but I think we sort of can go a level deeper on that in terms of Morrison as a radicalizing force like at the major party campaign level uh, what is really fascinating to me is that. Albanese and and his team managed to pull off this quite neat pea and thimble trick in a way like if we look at uh if we look at what the Labor Party said and did about Scott Morrison over the closing 12 months of the contest we've got a delegitimization exercise that is as effective as any of uh, that I have seen the the only one that's closer uh, or, or slightly better in degrees of order order of magnitude is what Tony Abbott did to Julia Gillard mm. in terms of orders of magnitude right there was an aggressive negative framing of the prime minister from the from the get-go that was sustained over over more than 12 months period um, but somehow Anthony Albanese managed to hover above that fray and not sort of get himself wound up in that which would have actually made him unpopular yeah because of the negativity anyway that's just a blasting observation about the radicalizing force of Scott Morrison it's partly Morrison it's part of what all these groups did with the with the prime minister's character largely using his own words yeah <laughs> right so that happened in terms of the difference core difference between 2019 because uh, an earlier iteration of the teals were on the field in 2019 uh, didn't do quite as well, although they got the breakthrough in Moringa, mm. obviously, with Zali Stegall. And Helen Haynes also uh, took over the seat of Indi from Cathy McGowan, which I think is the first time an independent had I think yeah, so. been elected I, I after, think another so, independent. after another independent, mm. right? So there was a bad change there. So, you know, as Cos Samaras, who's the pollster for the Teals, told me somewhat haughtily at one point, you know, if, if you'd looked closer, Murph, at the 2019 election result, you might have seen 2022 happening. Anyway, fair cop, Cos. <laughs> um, anyway, but the, 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 the critical thing, I think, between 2019 and 22 was um, candidate selection money. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of it. Uh, and I think they spent it effectively because it basically gave the teal campaigns a level of professionalization that they didn't have in the last Previously. cycle. And you talked about the fact that they were quite ruthless too about it wasn't just any old independent yeah. candidate. You had to no. be in with a chance. Basically, to win. yes. I think Climate 200 in terms of because candidate selection was obviously done at a distance from them. Yeah. But uh, Climate 200 took the decision if you, if you're not going to win if you if there's not a high probability of victory we're not going to give you scads of money we're yeah. just not going to do that we're going to focus our resources on yeah where we think we're going to break through so I thought it was really interesting there when you talked about like it turns out probably someone could have done really well in Higgins but there was no voices of type of campaign there Total so mystery. there was no one for them to back. Total mystery I've yeah. sort of I poke fun at myself um about this because if you're regular on the webina webinars you'll know that I was um I was saying the whole you know months before the election it's really hard for the for Labor to win and I genuinely believe that because I was looking at a conventional pathway to victory on an electoral map yeah quite hard <laughs> and it turns out it didn't exist there was an entire new pathway to victory anyway done me but it was sort of like I went from I think myself as a as an analyst and reporter sort of downplaying the prospects of this progressive breakthrough to then as I was preparing this thing then imagining conspiracy everywhere <laughs> was kind of like oh my god this was a total stitch up the whole time they obviously coordinated coordinated this they must have taken a decision not to run in Higgins because that gave Labor a critical seat right I was sort of like way deep in the conspiracy <laughs> had to go for several walks around the block and calm down really but um but it was yeah there were some interesting calls like Simon Holmes at court when I asked him why didn't you why wasn't there you know why wasn't there an independent in Higgins they said oh well a couple sort of presented but it just didn't materialize similarly right if a teal had had run in uh Brisbane or Ryan would they be green seats I don't yeah. know um you know if a teal had run in Benelong in Sydney would that now be a teal seat don't know but anyway basically where people ran and the resourcing that they were given 
uh, you know, made a very material impact on results mm. and then on the final seat count because obviously Labor got there in majority just. Yeah. So mm. the Greens also had uh, a very successful Amazing election. Campaign. Yeah. Mm. And in particular, um, again, taking Liberal seats, which yep. they're sometimes accused of focusing too much on, on Labor seats. So that was a, a really good campaign from the Greens with obviously great results in, in both houses. Um, I am interested, though, in the interviews that you did with Adam Bent mm -hmm. about how he works with Anthony Albanese. And um, I think there was a quote in there that he kind of, he knows that they can have very forceful differences of opinions, but he's very confident he, that Albo won't, won't lie right. to him. Yeah. Um, so I guess I wanted to, because both of those uh, leaders were around um, in different roles in 2010, uh, yep. in, in the Gillard yes, uh, term exactly. of parliament exactly. and had to work quite closely together. Yeah. Um, how much do you think that impacted both of them about how they now work together or hope to work together? Well, I think it's, I think the relationship's important. And as you say, Ed, the relationship was formed in the 43rd parliament, because I think that's the parliament that Adam Bant came in. That's right. Yes. Right. Yeah. So just, sorry, just haven't got haven't <laughs> so many elections in front of me. Yes. My <laughs> goodness, man, there's a lot of characters in this. Um, yeah. So he came in in the 43rd. Uh, Anthony Albanese at that time was the manager of government business. So he got to know all of the cross benches. Uh, oh, sorry. So Adam, I think came in in 20, 2010, 2010 but was around for the around regular for the yeah. yeah okay right there we go sorry that's uh that's my mistake so anyway they were um they they got to know each other quite well during that parliament because obviously Albanese's key job in the, in the Gillard phase was keeping the legislative program on on track uh I think look uh, Adam Bant and Anthony Albanese run political parties who are contesting for the same group of voters they're never going to sit out, sit down and hug it out, I don't think. Uh, you know, there would be reasonable questions about whether or not over the long term Labor's heading for a period of coalitionism with the Greens, a, a debate that goes around. And for residents in the ACT, we see that here, right? Yeah. But I think at this point, I think Adam Baird, you know, has been uh, the Greens leader to break through a, a, a plateau for the Greens in terms of representation. He has broken through. I think Labor strategists acknowledge that the Greens are doing materially better than them in terms of recruiting young people, particularly young voters. So I think Adam Bad, I suspect, is going to want to blaze his own path there and see what the what the whether there's a natural ceiling for Greens representation. So he's got his own objectives. The Prime Minister has got his objectives, obviously. And, you know, we might get to the big flex in the piece, which is, you know, that Albanese in this time of the, this mega trend of lack of major party support can see this major party moment, which yeah. I think is amazing. But anyway, park that, <laughs> put a pin in that. Um, what I'm saying is these guys do have different objectives. I think uh, where they're at in their heads is to try and maximise the position of both of their political movements. But for progressive people who are sitting out there wondering, is this going to be a complete car crash? Well, look, Maybe you can't rule that out, but I think as a starting proposition, uh, they they Adam Bant, you know, use very precise language to describe it. He he feels as though Anthony Albanese will not lie to him. That they have an open channel of communication where they can talk candidly about issues that they want to progress. Um, the big test of this, of course, is coming over the next six to twelve months as uh, as we get further and further into the substance of climate policy. Yeah whether or not these guys can hold it together enough to achieve, you know, first steps in getting this transition done or whether, you know, product differentiation starts to become more important. But anyway, I, I can't answer that question right now. Yeah. We just have to wait and see. Um, I did want to ask you about that major party moment that Anthony Albanese sees here and to just expand on that a little bit because the trend seems to have been away from direction. yeah major Entirely. parties for a long time. <laughs> so why does he why does he see that as the moment? Yeah, it was funny when we sort of spoke about that. I I I sort of remember being sort of mildly startled by it. Not that he would, not that that's where he would be in his head because Anthony Albanese is a Labor man to the core. Um, you know, his whole 
personal identity was formed in labor politics in sydney in the you know in the 70s and 80s it's it is how he thinks it is who he is so i'm not surprised at, at one level that he would want uh to try and sort of use this as a moment to remake the case for a major party in the Australian political tradition, i.e. the Australian Labor Party, because that's just how the guy thinks. But he genuinely does believe that because of, you know, demography, various realignments that we saw in the 2022 campaign, that if Labor can be a half decent government, if it can do what it said it would, you know, would do prior to the election, if it can sort of re restore that bedrock of trust that got eroded, well, actually came back during the first year of the pandemic yeah. and then got eroded and, and, and eroded substantially. He, he can see there's a, a moment there to capture uh, where, you know, you don't have to think about whether we're in a we're in a drift towards a Scandi style permanent major minority government arrangement, which is where Simon Holmes of Court's head is at. Yeah. Um, he, he Anthony Albanese does not see that as inevitable, but it's it's quite uh, you know, I've been in some of the conversations I've been having around the essay, I've described this as a flex because it's the only word I've got for it. Because yeah. if you look at the data, obviously. You know, the, the trend away from major party voting and departmentalization, <laughs> I think the political scientists call it. Anyway, sorry, guys. But that sort of the rust, what Gabby Chan, my dear friend and colleague Gabby Chan, would call rusting off. Yeah. Um, that this is basically fixed in the Australian electoral scene. This has been a progression of decades, not just of the last five minutes. And certainly, if we look at the Australian electoral, study that was released a couple of days ago that really underscores this mega trend right that major parties the big ramparts of the Australian democratic scene are in a period of catastrophic decline now um Anthony Albanese thinks not he thinks there's a coalition that you can build and by that I mean a voter coalition, a voter coalition. that you can build uh in order to restate remake the case for the stability, certainty, um, responsiveness of major parties. Now, that's a hell of an ambition to see yourself as a prime minister. That's a pedestal that, you you know, could be a long, nasty fall. <laughs> but that uh, that is certainly in his head. And he's sort of playing, I think, obviously governments have to be minutely focused on what's happening now, uh, you know, what's going to happen in three days' time, what's going to happen in three months and three years, right? You're always kind of refracting through that prism. But I think in his head, the sort of grand strategy is we can we can make the case that major party politics doesn't suck. Yeah. And if we do that, then we can basically reboot reboot the democratic project. Here. Yeah. Um, so I'll I've just got um kind of one more question before we go to questions from the audience. And I can see we've got nearly 800 people on the line with us. Thanks so much for joining us today. We'll get to your questions very shortly. But I did kind of want to end on um kind of the moment we find ourselves in now and and I guess the new politics yep. of the of the title. Um so I guess I was struck that um Christopher Pine kind of talked about his dealings with Anthony Albanese in a similar way to Adam Bant and some of the independents that you spoke to yeah. um, but also you kind of had a bit of a focus on the primacy of parliament yeah. and the, his understandings of the processes of parliament and why all of that is important and I guess and based around convention and why he really I think has chosen to in particular elevate um, things like the secret ministries and making yeah. a real point of that yeah. and that kind of Scott Morrison used to make fun of him sometimes yeah. for his attention to all of that stuff but talking about that loss of trust and why integrity was important do you think he's kind of responding is that his response to that movement within the electorate yeah I think it is uh I think it is I think he sort of understands this at uh I hate the word granular They're like when people say granular level yeah. but I think it's sort of I think it is uh I think it's true in this case I do think he has he does understand that at quite a granular level uh, and I think their initial down payments on that, as Eb said, obviously there's the Integrity Commission, there's how he conducts the parliament, like all of the sort of 
um, you know, consultations and stuff he does, whether or not he needs to or not. Yeah, I was going to say, because they're in majority. Yeah. They don't have to. So this is a down payment, yeah, I guess, on, on building some political capital. On, with, exactly. Yeah. On, and and with not only them, not only uh, people who have been democratically elected to represent their communities and who are trying to present a different, newer style of politics that's more you know, idealistic, community focused, all that sort of stuff. Um, I think he does understand that. I do think he understands that and wants to seek to validate it. Uh, now, obviously, if you're a, you know, if you're a very cynical person, um, and, you know, to some extent, we all are, you can say, well, that's just entirely self-interested, right? Uh, because obviously, while ever the buffer state of the Teals exist, it's extremely difficult for the Liberal and National Parties to get back in majority government. I think that's fair. I think it is absolutely in Labor's political interest to basically um, validate the Teal buffer state rather than seek to go to war with it. Um, and you could sort of say, well, uh, you know, this that that it's all responses, you know, the last six months basically have been responses to trends that are very obvious in, in any decent opinion polling you yeah. see, right? So it's just a survival instinct that's kicked in. Um, look, I think that's true. I, I do think obviously, like, you know, all these, everyone in politics operates with that mindset, with that very transactional mindset. It's It's partly true. But I do think Albanese has been thinking about his own version of dem democratic decay for quite a long period of time. Before he was opposition leader again, he and I had, uh, had a couple of really interesting conversations on my podcast, for example, mm -hmm. about his concern. His big anxiety, I think, as a progressive Australian has been the sort of the rise of cancel culture and uh, that people are not talking to one another anymore. And he views this through a prism of progress, right, as a person who's had to, getting back to our insurgent, right, either blast his way in or build coalitions in order to get himself in. The big kind of lesson of Anthony Albanese's professional life is nothing changes unless minds change. Yeah. Nothing ever changes, right? And so I think he's been turning around different versions of this in his head probably for the best part of a decade, mm -hmm. right? Like what, what, what you have to do as a progressive in this moment in order to make sure that progress continues to happen because, uh, you know, that's where he starts. But also, you know, what, what are the tools that enable progress to happen, which is why he's so fixated on the parliament, why he's so fixated on traditions and Westminster and all of that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. In his mind, I mean, this might sound a bit hyperbolic, but it's like, you know, that's these are the conventions and customs that stand between us and chaos. Yeah. Right. So I think it's sort of, you know, it might be even a bit diffuse in his own mind, right? It mightn't, it mightn't be that he's got a like 20 point plan, right? In his back pocket. But I do think he's been playing this around in his head for years and years. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because uh, in my observations, like a Labor government in a majority in a similar way to a, a coalition government in majority might be in political interest to keep uh, buffers like the Greens and others yeah. um, happy, but they don't often do it. Like no. I think this is quite a different approach for me Yeah, uh, no. from in my observation. No, no, so, no, 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 I think yeah. it's true, but I think it's also, you know, when one thing we did, slightly vault over in terms of, you know, who is this guy? Why does he operate this way? What's he had to learn? Mm. I think, you know, and the essay sort of does go to this a bit, Ed, like obviously the, the experience in that 43rd parliament was really important to this yeah. guy yeah. in terms of, well, several things. He, he basically, if you ask him, he will say to you, you know, if you say, what did the 43rd tell you, to teach you? Mm. What did you learn from that? He'll say in no particular order, I learned that you can have power and you can throw it away in a heartbeat. It's all gone. Yeah. And if it's gone, all the things that you did, all the things that you tried to make better, they're gone they're too. They're gone too. And the only way sometimes that you can try and fortify the, the policy leg legacy that you're trying to implement is relationships, is making sure that you've got as, as wide a footprint as wide a buy-in for all of that as possible. Mm. And that works 
you know, both practically in the parliament and looking over the heads of the parliamentarians, lawmakers to, to the voters, right? It's always about trying to expand the coalition for things that he think thinks are important. Yeah. So, uh, you know, will he be able to sustain this mode of operation over over time? Well, well, we're going to see. We sit on a on a perch very close to the net and we'll be keeping <laughs> very close watch. That's right. Um, I'm going to go to questions from the audience now. Uh, thank you. There's uh, heaps here. The first one is from Claire Pisani, who says, uh, was it a good call to support the stage three tax cuts and can Labor rescind that decision mm -hmm. given interest rates, inflation and survival struggles? You do touch on that very slightly in the in the essay. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think about oh, It's tricky. Well, if you're a regular on our webinars, uh, you'll know exactly what I think of the <laughs> stage three tax cuts, which isn't much. Um, but what, what do they do about it? Uh, look, I think we did see prior to the budget quite a conservative effort to start a conversation about whether or not, uh, you know, that that was that is viable in the current context, handing, you know, those tax cuts back to wealthy people is viable in the current economic context. context. But how that's going to play out is I'm not really sure. I know there are people in the government, certainly, who want to try and build a case for winding them back. That yeah. is absolutely dead cert. But uh, I think there are also others in the government who are quite concerned just at that core level that if you say you're going to do something, you need to do it. Yeah. Otherwise, you're kind of torpedoing your whole other integrity strategy. Yeah. Uh, and I think that dialogue is ongoing and probably will be for unfinished. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but you know, look, I think they they understand. You know, it's one of, it's one of those sort of you know sliding door moments. But like, could you replay the whole three years if you took a different position on stage three? Would they still have won the election? I mean, who knows? But uh, but it's kind of a bit of a mirror to the the climate policy exactly. decision, exactly. like where there they decided no, they were going to. You exactly. Know, stick to their guns and here wasn't worth the fight. It wasn't worth the fight, right? And you, and you make, you know, in opposition, you make a million calls like that. Mm. Some of them are good calls. Some of them are not good calls. I think stage three was not a good call. But I think if you ask them, there would be, you know, I don't know what whether it would be a majority or not in terms of the cabinet, but a number of people would say, you know, that we, that we had to take that decision quite early in the piece had we taken a different decision, that could have basically been a drag, a, a gravitational drag on us throughout the term. And look, maybe that's right. Who knows? Yeah. But anyway, they're fiscally reckless. Hopefully, hopefully we can inch towards sanity. Who knows? Uh, the next question is from Alicia Johnston, who says, can ALP support the level of climate action we need and still win the votes they need to stay in power? Really? Or are Greens and Teals the answer for climate policy essentially boy that's a good question i wish i knew the answer to it <laughs> i really do could really solve all the world's <laughs> problems. <laughs> really solve all the world's problems if we knew that one ed no i know it is an excellent question i'm not i'm not laughing about it that's that's a real cut through question uh and look i think their thinking in terms of 2022 was very much uh they did not feel confident that they could write off their traditional territories, the Labor Party, and have any prospect of majority government. Uh, so that was why that sort of climate policy discussion was so calibrated, right, and why the anxiety attack. It's like, have we got this right? This is like, it's like brain surgery, sort of like, have we got this right? And that's, that's, and again, if we sort of look to Labor's campaign review, which was released last night, it's not very long if you want to go and track that down on the internet and have a look at it. It's quite actually an interesting summary. I think the 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 view of um, the reviewers is uh, we, we have to still look to our regional territory mm -hmm. in terms of what they're saying to it, uh, you know, as Labor people to the Prime Minister. We, the Labor Party, have to still look at regional territory. We can't just sort of assume that this very neat realignment will occur in the electorate where the Liberal and National Parties become the regional party exclusively. Yeah. Labor, through a more metro-focused climate policy, becomes the, the, the city's of the city's party. And I think you, you know, talked in here about Paul Erickson kind of, I think Michelle Rowland had theories. asked him, yeah, yeah that that yeah. actually, no, that wasn't where we saw the future, yes. that it, it wasn't the 
the teal seats essentially yes. that Labor was aiming for. It yeah. was bigger than that. Well, and Ebs pointing to important context, which is that there has been this debate in mm. the Labor Party for several years now about whether or not such a realignment is possible, whether or not the Labor Party can decouple from its Labourist roots and represent progressive people in metropolitan Australia and leave, uh, you know, the coalition to regional territory. Um, you know, the smartest people in the Labor Party have been around and around that question for several years. I think their resting dis disposition remains, no, we can't actually do that. It's not how it would work. Uh, and we need to sort of, you know, maintain our Laborist roots because otherwise, you know, maybe you can pull it off in an electoral sense, maybe, but are we even the Labor Party anymore? If we yeah, um, I guess in terms of climate policy, Catherine talks about this concept of swimming between the flags. And so the context now is obviously that we have a climate supermajority in the um, parliament yeah. and the Australians clearly voted for climate action. But can you just expand a little on that idea yeah. of swimming between the flags? Well, well it is uh, because if you look at that sort of, yeah, I, I characterise it, sorry about all the beach metaphors, God, <laughs> but it just seemed to work. It just seemed to give me a scaffold and a structure. Um, uh, yeah, I, I sort of describe that deliberation as like swimming between the flags. At a certain point, you know, you could go slightly outside the flag, but a shark might get you, right? So it's sort of that it's, it reflects a, a point in time judgment that they make about how can we basically keep our traditional territories, speaking honestly to them, how can we also keep faith with our metro progressive vote voting base? Um, you know, that is that is a highly calibrated exercise. Now, you could look perhaps at the um, 2022 election result and you could say, oh, well, they, they possibly could have been braver. Maybe the flags could have been extended further, further up the beach. Maybe they could have actually gotten away with electorally uh, advocating a higher target. Um, it's sort of, it is for me, it, that's imponderable because it's sort of like you don't know what other, you know, what other effects you put in motion. But as Eb says, right, this has been, and, you know, the first election that I've seen since 2013, like we're back to sort of where we were in 2007 in terms of where mm. the community's at, in terms of wanting action, right? Um, there is, as Eb says, a super majority. There's the Greens, um, you know, expanded electoral footprint. There is uh, the Teals uh, basically sitting in Liberal Party centre-right progressive metro heartland. Um, and the Labor Party, there is a super majority there for action. Um, I suspect the first iteration of action that we're going to see is, you know, what Labor promised at the election for two reasons. One, that integrity point that we raised with stage three, that's a problem. The other moving part in all of this is energy and energy prices and what's happening in that debate at mm. the present time. Now, at the time when these guys had their anxiety attack in the shadow cabinet, about 43%, obviously hostilities were building up. In, in terms of Russia, Ukraine, but that, that conflict had not yet happened. And that conflict has created this, you know, global energy shock, right, which has then sort of pushes people into cost of living territory with energy, which again is politically difficult for that supermajority, all, yeah. all the components of that supermajority. So anyway, um, you know, talk about swimming between the flags. I think we've got to swim out a little further, I think, to see how all of this sort of eventually coalesces. But I think uh, Labor will be minded, uh, notwithstanding this idea that maybe they could have been more ambitious to try and stick to what they said they would do. Mm. Um, I do have a, a question uh, around energy and um, fossil gas and all of those mm -hmm. um, huge expenses at the moment, the costs going through the roof. Yep. Cabinet has been put off, uh, yes. I think, because Anthony Albanese has COVID at the moment. They were due to discuss that. Yeah. What what are the options on on that at the moment in terms of the energy regular the, mm. the regulatory intervention? Yeah, well, look, um, I think the prime minister had hoped to try and bring the premiers into uh, a comfortable alignment uh, this week. Uh, basically, uh, what they're looking at are price caps for gas and for uh, electricity. In the east coast sense of electricity, that is coal. Uh, the majority of, you know, still of generation on the East Coast is still coal-based. Um, uh, there was some advice that went to Shadow Cabinet. Uh, this is the federal cabinet we're talking about, to be clear, uh, about a week ago that said gas is fine. You can you can do price caps for gas, uh, but 
coal we're not so sure about because yep. that's normally the province of the states and um of course queensland still owns some of the generators yep. so it's sort of the the legal advice was oh, we think we, we think you can do it but we're not entirely certain It'd be better if you could actually get the, get states, the states to do it, it. Uh, and of course and- it risks um you know there's other considerations obviously if you're making fossil fuel cheaper that helps out with cost of living but then it gives you a climate change problem no well that's right that's right so anything it's sort of like anything that you do in this area has sort of other effects it's, yeah and part of the reason you know where the energy market is in such a stage notwithstanding the global energy shock which is you know the, uh, the lion's share of the problem right at the moment but you know we've had this history of absurd interventions in the energy market for the best part of a decade because we couldn't have a perfectly functioning carbon price yeah so the more you intervene the more adverse consequences you can build up down the track which i think the government has uh, front of mind but obviously they've got a short-term problem that they have to address mm. so look i think the latest on this the prime minister uh did uh an interview from his sick bed in curabilly uh with virginia v- virginia trioli in um the abc in melbourne this morning he said uh look we'll we'll go again national cabinet on friday uh, but uh, but people need not worry in terms of the delay because what we're planning in terms of a new default market offer for electricity that that we, we that wouldn't happen until February anyway was yeah. Albanese's line this morning, but yeah so where they're going price caps on um, on uh, coal and gas obviously temporary price caps to Ebb's point. Um, and also, uh, you know, sort of turning the code of conduct for the gas industry from a voluntary agreement to a mandatory one. Yeah. That's sort of the levers that we're looking at. But the premiers have all been doing what uh, premiers do, which is trying to maximise their own bargaining position in this quite fraught transaction for the government. Uh, obviously, have we seen Anastella, Anastasia Palaszczuk and uh, do that uh most forcefully uh, and echoed slightly in New South Wales. The PM thinks he'll get the premiers there. I assume it involves a bucket of money to some degree because it, that's the COAG story and we'll just have to see how it all fits together sort of by the end of this week and into next week. Yeah, I thought I had more time. We've only got three minutes left. Oh so God. very quickly, um, I did have a, there was a question around um Albo's upbringing in public housing and how we might expect that to have a greater emphasis on uh, for labour on that. But also I was interested in a question around Albo's media strategies and labour's tactics, especially towards the Murdoch media during the um, campaign. Um, so I don't know if you can oh, tackle quickly. both of those quickly. Well, I'll, go, I'll, I'll do it as, as quickly as I can. In terms of the, the welfare question, I assume the question is concerned about the gap between rhetoric and reality because a number yeah. of people are. And the right? huge housing crisis. Yeah, 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 huge housing crisis. Like, well, you know, it's all very well for Anthony Albanese to grow up poor. Will he actually do anything for poor people? Yeah. Reasonable question. Uh, and uh, the answer is is probably as far as I can see looking at it maybe um so let's just see how that translates um in terms of the other question which was dealing with the Murdoch dealing dealing with the Murdoch uh press well I think look I think Anthony Albanese honestly wanted to send us all off to see um by the end of the campaign I think it was not just the Murdoch media I think he was hardly sick of all of us frankly and we all got a bit of a hiding in the Labor campaign review for being superficial and ridiculous. Um, so there's that. In terms of the Murdoch press, obviously he's had Kevin Rudd about the place, uh, calling for royal commissions and so forth, and that has some purchase amongst the Teals and the Greens in the Parliament. Um, uh, Anthony Albanese has chosen not to uh, step over that barbed wire fence at this point <laughs> in time for obvious reasons. Uh, I think he is hoping that... He can use, you know, a solid opening in this first six months of the government to just assert a bit of authority, prime ministerial authority, so things are not quite so nuts all the time. Um, Good luck with that, Catherine Murphy says to him. (laughs) Um, But uh, because the reason things are crazy, uh, it's like obviously, you know, the whole kind of Murdoch framing is is bad. It is bad for democracy on a number of levels. But there's a reason why you know, the media is a circus and crazy and it's beyond who owns the media at this point in time. Mm. That's a whole other conversation and possibly doesn't get to the nub of the thing. I think, yeah, but the the short answer is I think he hopes persuasion 
uh, we'll get him a decent, we'll get get him a fair and decent treatment, not adulation, but just decent treatment, fair, accurate treatment. Seems a little bit naive to me, but anyway, we'll see. <laughs> well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Thank you so much, Catherine, for joining us in the studio today. Thank you all of you for tuning in. This has been a special summer series episode of Follow the Money. All our webinars are free and available on the Australia Institute's YouTube channel at australiainstitute.tv. You can find all our latest research and content at australiainstitute.org.au and we're on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS. My Twitter handle is ebony underscore Bennett with a double N double T and Catherine Murphy is at Murphyroo. Our podcast producer is at Jennifer Macy. Our theme music is by Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum with additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. Thanks for listening.